Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started in our second hour. Again, we're delighted to have the, both the Howards and the Pattersons with us this morning just to catch you up a little bit. In our second hour study, we've been doing study of the life of Christ. It's based on uh, Harmony of the Gospels by Dr. Robert Thomas. And we're, it's a 13 part study. We're in part 11, but those parts have subparts to them. And we're in part three of part 11. That's why it says that. Uh, we're actually, we've been looking at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. So that discourse is the last of six major discourses that Matthew's Gospel is organized around. Of course, it, uh, it's one that's very important to the disciples. You remember what prompted the discourse. Uh, Jesus was in the temple on Tuesday morning. He'd had this strong confrontation with the religious leaders of Israel. They left the temple, went across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. And as they're making that journey, the disciples point out to Christ, wow, look at the temple. Isn't it a beautiful building? And Christ's response, rather than sharing in the admiration for the beauty of the temple buildings, and they were beautiful, is that he says this to the disciples. Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. I don't think that's what they were expecting. And it prompts questions in their minds. Uh, three questions, actually. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, I think they were tying those things together. They thought that when Christ predicts the destruction of the temple, that that was going to be the end of the age and that his coming would be at the end of that. Well, Christ goes on to describe in the discourse both things that are affiliated with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and then things that are affiliated with his second coming. And he doesn't explain that there's going to be this long gap of time in between those two events. I think he did that by design. Uh, certainly from where we stand in history now, we can look back and see there were certain things that were fulfilled in 70 AD, but Christ did not come back physically at that time. He didn't come back and sit upon the throne of David, which is very explicit at the end of chapter 25 that that's what he will do. So it, it's a little easier for us to understand from where we are in history than it was for the apostles. But he does go on to describe the kinds of things that would happen between the point at which he gave the discourse and his second coming, things that we've seen as far as wars and rumors of wars and one nation rising up against another, famines, earthquakes. But all that was just the beginning of birth pangs. And there would be a certain point where there would be an abomination of desolation that was predicted by Daniel the prophet back in, or Daniel the state, someone who was served as a prophet, I should say, back in Daniel chapter 9. We talked about that. And then he goes on to talk about what the coming of the Son of Man will be like. On the one hand, it could happen at any point, and they should always be ready for it at any point. But on the other hand, nobody knows the exact day or the hour. So where, where we are now are, as Christ has given all this instruction about things to come regarding both the temple and his second coming, he now moves to parabolic teaching like he's been doing for a while to teach two major concepts. One is watchfulness for his coming. The second is faithfulness while you wait for him to come. Those two are very much tied together. When we say watchfulness, we don't mean sell everything, go sit up on a mountaintop and wait for him to come back. We mean live in light of that coming, living in such a way that you won't be ashamed at his second coming, uh, living very much with an eye towards hearing him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So we're going to look at five parables that teach those two things. Um, let me just read to you Matthew 24, 42, which serves as kind of a bridge to what he's already been relating as far as what's to come and then introducing what these parables are going to teach him. Bless you. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. That really kind of introduces these five parables. And they are very much instruction on how should we then live. In light of these things that I've just told you about, the coming destruction of the temple and my second coming, how should not only the 12 live, even though this was directed directly to them, they're the only ones in Christ's presence at this point, but it's very much relevant for us because we still ask that same question and the, the instruction in the parables is very relevant for us today. Francis Schaeffer, <coughs> some of you probably know him, wrote books called How Should We Then Live? It's really 
how do we conduct ourselves in light of the truth of Scripture? So the, the first, second, and fourth of these five parables emphasize watchfulness. And again, that's spiritual watchfulness in particular. The third and fifth emphasize faithfulness and service. And as I said, there's a significant overlap between those two ideas. There's also, as we're going to see from these five parables, significant overlap in their content, kind of in the in the situation in each case. One, I think, is significantly different from the other four, but all of them have to do, well, we'll see. So the first is the parable of the journeying master and his slaves. Now, this one is unique to Mark's gospel. All the rest will be in Matthew's. So let's start here in Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 33. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is, that is, the appointed time of Christ's return. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigned to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. So you've got a man here who owns the house. He has multiple slaves. Each one of them has their assigned responsibility within the house, and they're to carry that out while he's away. Now, the doorkeeper in particular would be the one, as you could imagine, might also consider him a gatekeeper. He would watch for anybody coming or leaving from the estate. So the idea of watchfulness is there for sure. But really, for all of the slaves, they would be mindful of the fact that at one point the master is going to be going to return and they need to be fulfilling their responsibilities in that process. Verse 35, therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, at cock crowing, or in the morning. Now that's language really that describes the four watches of the night. And in each case, it's using terminology that describes the end of each of those watches. There were four <laughs> watches that began at 6 p.m. Each one lasted three hours. So the first one would be evening, which was six to nine. The second would be midnight, nine to, to midnight. The third would be 12 to 3. What's it called? Third watch. Or cock crowing. It's actually called cock crowing because that's when the cocks did their thing. That's when they cried out. And then the morning would be uh, 3 to 6 in the morning. So again, the idea, well, let me ask you, what's the main point of this parable? It's clear enough. It's A lot of these are very straightforward, a little less complicated than the parables that we saw in Matthew 13. What would you say, if you had to summarize in a sentence, what's the lesson of this parable? Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready and stay faithful. Be faithful in your service until Christ returns. And again, that, that lesson or some variation of it is going to be prominent in all these parables. What's, what's the consequence if you're not ready? Lest he, the master, comes suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, so we see the extension there, from the apostles to all believers in Christ that have come to faith between his first and second coming, I say to all, be on the alert. Again, it's, it's spiritual watchfulness. It's, it's not just passive watching until the day of Christ's coming, but it's carrying out your responsibilities, living in such a way that you're cognizant of his coming. All right, let's look at the next one. Now we're back in Matthew's gospel. And this is Matthew 24, verse 43. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you be ready too. The Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. It's interesting the way that he teaches in this one. You know, we live in a day now where we have security systems and gated communities, and uh, we don't have to have the same kind of watchfulness that folks back in Jesus' day did. And, and my guess is, I mean, they had to sleep and rest too, so they're not staying up all night waiting for a thief to come. The point that he's making here is if they knew a thief was coming, then they would definitely be awake and watchful. And it would be relatively easy for a thief to break into a house back in. They could just bust down part of the wall and, and slip in. Clay walls, for the most part. In this case, he's saying, because you don't know, 
when a thief is coming, you've got to be watchful. And and in the same way, you don't know what day Christ is coming back, so you've got to be watchful all the time. So that's the lesson here. Be prepared for an any moment return. Now that's one perspective on watchfulness. We are going to see a little bit different from some of the other parables as far as, you know, we think of an any moment return today as, well, Christ can come today. He can come after we, before we finish this service, or he could come one day this week. But a per- perspective is going to change a little bit in some of the rest of the parables, at least from the vantage point of the 12 originally. So let's look at, at the next one. Whoops. I mean to show that. Uh, the parable of the two masters, and this is <clears throat> beginning in verse 45 of Matthew 24. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave? Now, we've already learned what a slave is this morning, right? In this case, it's a follower of Christ. Uh, He's the master, we're the slave. And who is the one that serves his master prudently? Whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Now, this is talking about a particular kind of slave that was responsible for the other slaves as as far as providing them with the necessary food, nutrition, for them to do their jobs. And you can imagine that was a very important responsibility for this particular one because if the other ones are getting hungry and not able to have the strength that they need to do their work, then the estate's going to suffer. Verse 46, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing, that is, distributing the food at the proper time, when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions, But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. So you see the difference. It's the same role in each case, but he's illustrating with two different kinds of uh, servants. One who says he wants to be pleasing to the master and he wants to uh, be doing what he's supposed to be doing when the master returns. And he doesn't know when he's going to return. The second one says, I don't I think he's going to be a while before he comes back. He's taken a lot of provisions with him. I can do what I want to, at least for a while, maybe worry about later when he's going to come back. If that evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, and so began to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him in an hour which he does not know. So, What is the the two slaves? What do they represent? And, you know, we think of a parable as an earthly story to represent a spiritual truth. What in this case do the two kinds of slaves represent? Believers and non-believers. Okay, so that would be one way to look at it. I think you could even say it as, in both cases, professors. Profess people who profess to believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. And the way that they conduct themselves in light of their profession and in light of what they know. Um, Let's say that we do limit it to that. What would you make the division? How would you make the division then? I mean, you could make it as between genuine believers and false professors on the one hand. People that truly live in light of Christ's return and people that don't, and not only don't live in light of that, but they, they really live very unfaithful lives, wicked lives says here that they beat their fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. They're not in any way letting the prospect of the return of Christ affect how they live in this life. In both cases, the master comes on a day that they don't expect, right? But in one case, the faithful slave, he's always ready because he's doing what he's supposed to do. And he, what motivates him to do that? Love. Love, exactly. It's not just that, hey, Christ could come at any time and I I need to be doing what I'm doing in light of that. It's because he truly knows the master. He loves the master. And that's what motivates him to be faithful. The other one, not so much. He's he's not doing anything out of love for the master. He's doing what he wants to do, even if he acknowledges in some degree that he has a master. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour which he does not know and shall cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. Now, again, I think that's an argument maybe that supports the idea of somebody who professes Christ, not not a rank unbeliever at least, 
but doesn't live that way. There should be weeping. Weeping shall be there and the gnashing of teeth. Now, what's that referring to? No. Hell. It's talking about eternal damnation, eternal separation <clears throat> from God. What we learn more about through the Gospels and through the book of Revelation is the lake of fire. And that will be the ultimate destiny of those who don't live uh, faithful lives for Christ. Now we come to the, the one that's a little different. Well, let's let's summarize the lesson here. How would you summarize the parable of the two slaves lesson? And again, very close to the other ones, but how would you what would you say? Um, if you truly love the master, you will take care of those he loves. Okay, if you truly love the master, you take care of those he loves, you are faithful to the responsibilities that he has entrusted to you. Now that's going to be different for different people. I think the love aspect is going to be common to all of them. But, you know, God gifts us differently. He puts us in different situations, gives us different opportunities. But the overall general lesson is to be faithful with what he has entrusted us until he comes back. And we didn't really tie this into our one sentence summary, but don't allow the delay of Christ's return to corrupt faithful service. Now, that's what I was talking about as far as being a little bit different aspect of be ready for an any moment return. We think when we say that of something more soon, but I mean, it's been 2000 years since the apostles heard this and he hasn't come back yet. And it's still relevant for us today. We don't know when Christ is coming. It could be in our lifetimes. It could be a thousand years from now. Uh, in any case, we're always to be mindful of his return and living in light of that. Okay? And it is, as I said before, more than passful, passive watchfulness. It's just important to discharge your responsibilities as a believer. And that includes all spheres. I'm not talking about just ministry at your local church. He is as important as that is. But ministry in your families, ministry at the workplace, however you earn your living, it's just a call to faithfulness to Christ, no matter what you're doing. So both faithfulness and unfaithfulness ultimately are recompensed, right? They're recompensed justly by God. And we're going to see next week when we get into the latter part of chapter 25 and the sheep and goats judgment, that God judges with righteous judgment. And he repays each one according to the way that they conducted themselves, not just based on what they say, but how they live. Okay, now let's look at the one in the parable of the ten virgins. Now this one is, is a little different, I think, than the other ones, and it's interesting. Um, I want to well, think about some background here before, even before we read the parable. In the Old Testament, you have uh, at times this figure of Yahweh being the, the husband of Israel, and frequently, if not always, Israel is an unfaithful wife. In the New Testament, you have not only the imagery of John the Baptist as who? In relation to Christ. The okay, so he's the forerunner, but what about with, within the imagery of a wedding? The, the John the Baptist. The best, the, the, the best man, the friend of the bridegroom. <clears throat> that's right. And Christ himself is the bridegroom. And then that's later developed into Christ as the husband of the church, right? His bride is the church. So we kind of got that kind of background, but we also, it's helpful for us to understand some of the uh, background of an Oriental or Middle East wedding in general. And I want to read to you what I found was a good summary by a guy named John Walford. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. He's a mm -hmm. dispensationalist. Uh, I think he's with the Lord now, but he taught at Dallas Seminary for many years and wrote a number of books. Here's what he had to say about the wedding. I think it's very helpful for this particular parable. The oriental wedding had three stages. First, the parents of the bridegroom and the bride would agree on the marriage of their children and the dowry would be paid. Uh, paid from the family of the man who was going to marry to the family of the bride. This was the legal marriage. Secondly, sometime later, according to their customs, the bridegroom, accompanied by his friends, would proceed from his home to the home of the bride to claim her as his own. Remember, uh, there was a time of betrothal 
after this point at which the marriage was legally contracted, there was a period really of testing to see if the bride would be faithful. Remember, that's what got Mary in trouble was the assumption was she'd become pregnant during the betrothal period, and that's why Joseph wanted to put her away privately. Of course, that came to light that that wasn't uh, what had happened. So they would proceed from the home to the home of the bride to claim her as his own. Traditionally, this procession often took place in the middle of the night. The bride, prepared for the bridegroom's coming, would join the procession, which would then return to the home of the bridegroom. Third, friends would join the procession in order to participate in the marriage feast, which was held at the house of the bridegroom. And such a feast would often continue for days, depending upon the wealth of, the, of those involved. So a wedding, accordingly, had three stages. The legal stage arranged by the parents, the procession of the bridegroom claiming his bride, and the marriage feast, the celebration of the wedding. And you have that same kind of picture in the book of Revelation, right? I think we talked about this when we were back there in Revelation. You have the rapture of the church and the actual wedding ceremony of the church being with Christ in heaven during that seven years of tribulation period. And then the church comes back with Christ. Then you've got people saved during the tribulation as well. But they all participate in the wedding feast, which is the millennial kingdom. So in with all that as background, let's read now Matthew 25, 1 through 13. I think it'll make more sense. <clears throat> then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, you might think of these ten virgins as bridesmaids. They could have really been friends of either the bride or the groom. We're not told. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps... They took no oil with them. And I think in the context here, it means they didn't have any extra oil. They had a certain amount in their lamps, or they wouldn't have worked in the first place. But they didn't have enough. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Now, I should note that <clears throat> there's some disagreement about the nature of these lamps. You've probably seen these small lamps that uh, hold oil and they have a little flame coming out of the spout. As long as you got oil in there, the, uh, the lamp's going to continue to burn. Some people think that this is more like a torch with rags at the top soaked in oil and it would burn and help light the way for them to make their procession. Whichever one is more accurate, you gotta have extra oil when your lamp starts to go out in order to be able to make the whole procession and get to the, uh, the wedding feast. Foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered saying, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. So what's the point of this parable? <clears throat> and, and think about the ones that we've already looked at. The fact that the oil um, burned out and stuff like that, I think, comes back to the fact that we don't know when he's coming. It could be a very long time. Exactly. And so you better have a lot of oil. And that oil, to me, represents faithfulness. You better have a lot of that faithfulness because if you run out of oil or you run out of faithfulness and you start living a sinful life and he should return during that time, you're going to be like the five virgins who, who, to whom he said, I never knew you. Exactly. That's a very good explanation. The idea is one of ongoing faithfulness, perseverance, because we don't know how long it's going to be. Uh, and we don't really shouldn't matter to us. I mean, on the one hand, we want Christ to come back. Uh, at the end of the book of Revelation, the Apostle John says, come Lord Jesus. I think all of us want that because we know how much better things will be uh, when he does return. But <coughs> We also want to be faithful, and we want to be faithful all the way to the point that he comes back. I mean, you can be faithful for a long time. Like Andre said, you start turning unfaithful 
and that previous faithfulness doesn't help you. It also doesn't help you, uh, you know, the faithfulness and preparedness can't be transferred. I think that's the significance of the other uh, bridesmaids or virgins not being able to help them. Uh, they have to be faithful themselves all the way to the end. So what are we doing with verse 12? Truly, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. I think it's an indication that they were not the Lord's. They didn't belong to him. So these, these, again, this is a separating of those that look like yep. they're faithful from mm-hmm. those that are. Exactly. And it's, you know, surprising how much of the scripture deals with that kind of separation. Obviously, we have a separation between uh, believers and unbelievers, But you also have a separation between false professors and professors. And we're even dealing with that in 2 Peter and Jude. You've got people that claim an association and an allegiance to Christ. They're actually his enemies. And they're trying to make those that are truly his stumble. So you've got a similar kind of thing in Matthew's Gospel where this group of people says, "Um, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things for you, miracles and everything he says depart from me i never knew you so somebody just because they claim to know christ and we got to be careful about doubting somebody's profession but you know the way that they live is ultimately going to be the the real indicator of the genuineness of their profession let me get kathleen again and that would be primarily because we don't want to assume someone's saved and they're not and so we missed opportunities yeah. to share the gospel and whatnot, you know, without, you know, calling them out necessarily. But just so to be sure. My my assumption is if somebody claims to be a believer and they can explain the gospel and I have some knowledge of, you know, are they tied into their local church? Are they serving? I take them at their word mm-hmm. that they're a believer. Now, if they start to live in such a way that uh, questions that, I still don't know for sure that they're not a believer, but it does give me enough cause to say, look, you've made this profession and you're doing this in a continuing way. Now, we all stumble, but there's enough there to make me question them, and I think I have a responsibility to speak to them at that point, mm-hmm. and for them to look at their own heart to say, okay, am I, am I saved? And, you know, the scripture backs that up as we're supposed to examine ourselves to see that we're in the faith. Yeah, there's assurances in scripture for ourselves to know I, I really am saved. That's right. And sometimes they need to see those. Well, they need to see those, but they also need to question whether they're saved if right. they're not living, uh, if they're living in sin in a continuous way. I think it's important to make a, a differentiation to among the five virgins who don't have enough oil that some of them deliberately don't have enough oil. They don't have enough faith. And they, they, they're they really trying, they think they're fooling God and fooling others, but they're really not fooling anybody. But then there are some that are um, led astray and stuff like that. That's kind of what we're talking about with Dave and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they're being led by, you know, Roman Catholics, for example, go to church week after week and they do the ashes and they do this and they do everything. They really believe that they're doing what God wants them to do and because they listen to their priest, their priests and stuff like that. But they're really being led slightly uh, off the path, slight ever so slightly, but still slightly off the path. So I think in those five virgins, there's a, a, a little bit of each. Yeah, I mean, those five versions could represent a very broad section of people that are either deceived or or self-deceived. I think at that point, we fall back on the fact that certainly God has chosen those that are his own. As David talked about this morning, God will keep and, and Christ will not lose a single one of those that are his own. And at the same time, we have responsibility to keep ourselves. I mean, we have responsibility like the wise virgins did to, to persevere and to make sure we are prepared for his coming and, and staying faithful all the way to the end. Okay? He answered and said, Truly I say, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And that, well, let's summarize the lesson here for the ten virgins. 
Again, we have some of these that speak of an any moment return and being ready that way. Some that say that are more emphasizing, hey, it could be a long time and you need to be prepared all the way to the end. So don't be prepared for a long, don't be unprepared for a long delay and thus shut out at the end. Be prepared, keep watching. Now the last one, the parable of the profitable and unprofitable servant. Some could title this the parable of the talents. Um, just a little background on this. A talent in that day was really first a unit of measure, uh, a unit of weight of silver or some other valuable commodity. It became also like a coinage. Uh, and the, the amount of, of money entrusted here is very large. Uh, a talent was equal to 6,000 denarii. Uh, denarius was a day's wage, so it's quite a large amount of money. We're going to see here that there were varying amounts that were entrusted to each one of the servants based on the master's evaluation of what they could handle. So let's read the parable here. Uh, this is in Matthew 25, beginning of verse 14. For it, that is, the return of Christ, it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. So you see the picture here. Again, it's a household or somebody that's quite wealthy, and he's going away on a journey. They don't know how long he's going to be gone. He's entrusting everything that he has, basically, at his estate to these different slaves. <coughs> Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one also who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted to me two talents. See, I've gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Again, they were initially entrusted with varying amounts based on what the master thought they could do and do well with. And they, they multiplied those amounts accordingly. But they're given basically the same reward. They both enter to enjoy their master and they're both commended for their faithfulness. The one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Now, this slave's attitude is very different from the other two. Uh, he basically had no love for his master. It was therefore, like we said before, not motivated for any kind of faithful service. He was afraid of the risk of losing what had been entrusted to him. D.A. Carson writes about this one. His failure betrays his lack of love for his master, which he masks by blaming his master and excusing himself. And his repayment, if you will, is quite different. His master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival, I would receive my money back with interest. At a minimum, he could have done that, right? Uh, at no risk, well, very little risk at least. And he didn't even do that. Take away, therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the 10 talents. Now, we, again, we might think, well, that's kind of a strange thing to do. The one that has 10 talents multiplied as five with five more. Now you're giving the one talent to him. Why not give it to the one who, uh, you know, the one in the middle? Um, but that's a kind of a general principle, right? We saw the same thing in the parables back in Matthew 13. To him who has, more shall be given to him. And to him who doesn't have, even when he has, it should be taken away uh, in, a, in, a, in a form of judgment. And that's what's taking place here. And that's what verse 29 says. To everyone who has, shall more be given. He shall have an abundance. 
but from the one who does not have, even when he does have, shall be taken away. And cast out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So these are five separate parables. And summarize that last one is be faithful in multiplying the resources which the master has entrusted <clears throat> until he returns. And I don't think you can limit uh, what the talents are here as some people would say, okay, that's spiritual gifts, it's abilities, it's opportunities, it's financial resources. I think it's all those things. You know, each one of us, and this is from the book of Ecclesiastes, we don't decide the situation that we're born into, much less the day that we're born. And each one of us comes up with a different portion based on a lot of things that we have absolutely no control over. But God controls those things. And we're not called to compare ourselves with what somebody else does. We're called and will be judged by what God has entrusted to us and how we've stewarded that, how we've multiplied it. And again, in this case, it's multiplying it not for our use so much, but for the good of the kingdom. Some of it would be our use, to be sure, to take care of our needs, the needs of our family. But <clears throat> that's what we'll be judged on. And again, depending on what our attitude toward the master is and whether or not we have love for him is going to determine how we live. So that, well, we're still in the Olivet Discourse next Sunday. We're, we'll finish at this point. We'll start going to the judgment, uh, the sheep and goats judgment in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. Uh, really important section of the discourse, finishing out chapter 25. Uh, so if you want to do some reading in advance, you can just read that last section from 25, 31 down to verse 46. <clears throat> Any questions about any of these? I, I felt like these were a lot easier than the ones in, in 13. Um, they're pretty short and they all have that common theme of watchfulness and faithfulness and service. Along that line to that second one, and again, I always refer back to conversations I had with my mother and stuff like that. You know, uh, it seems to me like God gives each of us spiritual gifts. Yet he also gives us financial gifts and other gifts, health and stuff like that. But the spiritual gifts that he gives us are not for us to hoard, but he gives them to us so that we can share them with others. And that's what I think the Jewish people never wanted. They had their God, he was their God, and they did not want to share their God with anyone else because he, they really did know the miracles that he could do for them. And so they figured like he was their secret, you know, uh, their secret helper kind of thing. He didn't, they didn't want him to help anybody else in the world. And that's the exact opposite of what God had put them here to do to teach the rest of the world about him. That's right. I mean, it was very clear as you read what their mission is, and it's a mission to the world. They were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, not a kingdom with priests. They were to be the mediators as a nation between God and the rest of the world. And I agree with your assessment there. Somehow they got mixed up to the point where it was all about them and their relationship with God, which was very significant, but they forgot and they despised the other nations. And that was not what God intended. And certainly for where we are today as the church, uh, we are to use our spiritual gifts, especially to edify others in the church. That's what spiritual gifts are all about. Um, Paul talks about that a lot in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. But we're, we're also to live faithfully when we're not assembled together as a church in such a way that other people see Christ in us and, and we serve them. I mean, we serve unbelievers, not not always with spiritual gifts because I think they have to be enlightened to understand the significance of spiritual gifts, but certainly we demonstrate love and do what's best for them and all the context that we find ourselves in throughout the week. Like the song we sang, they will know we are Christians by all the things that are in that, in that, that uh, hymn. Exactly. By our love as much as anything. <laughs> I mean, that's straight scripture there too. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments before we close? That last verse 30, where it says the worthless slave, mm -hmm. that word worthless, I mean, we don't want to be worthless. No. And uh, I think he called him that earlier, too. You wicked, lazy slave, he says, <clears throat> in verse 26. So, I mean, again, 
you have a higher accountability if you profess to be a believer and you conduct yourself like this. Um, it's going to be bad enough for unbelievers judged as they are, but when you claim the name of Christ and you live in a way that doesn't reflect that, I think your, your judgment's even greater. Very hard to, for us to conceive of degrees of difficulty in hell, but I think they're there. I think scripture teaches that. So the very, very nice church person who who is actually teaching and everything else, but isn't saying they're to a higher accountability. Yes. Hell to a higher accountability because they're moving around in the word itself. Yes, and I, I would say the false teachers, the ones that are doing the kinds of things that Jude talks about, are the ones that are really culpable. I mean, they're basically agents of Satan sent to destroy the church. Um, you know, sometimes you hear about somebody who is in a position of leadership in the church, and they at some point recognize, hey, I, I wasn't saved myself. And I, I think there is opportunity for them to repent and be saved. But I, I just think. You know, the greater the account or the greater the opportunity that you've had, the light that you've had, um, to whom much is given, much is required. And that's a basic principle of judgment, of God's judgment. So if you're in a church where the leadership is good, okay, but things keep coming in that have to be dealt with, you don't leave. No, I wouldn't. I mean, if the leadership is dealing with things that have to be dealt with, that's a really good sign. It's the other way that you want to be yeah. careful about. Okay, fed a good morning. Worship together again. Grateful for the Pastors and the Howards visiting with us. And, uh, let's pray and, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we are grateful even when we're looking at passages that speak about our accountability before you and the judgment that we face as believers, we know as believers that you use judgment as a positive motivation. And we thank you that it is a righteous judgment. It is a judgment that knows our motivations even better than we do. <clears throat> and it is a judgment that flows out of not condemnation for our sins because those have already been paid for by Christ, but out of faithfulness and service. Uh, and we want to serve you faithfully because we love you. Uh, we love you because you first loved us. We recognize that even though there is a, a responsibility and accountability on our part to believe, you're the one that initiates, you're the one that opens our eyes even to see our need for Christ, our own sinfulness, and opens our eyes to understand the truth of the gospel. So we thank you for that. Uh, for those of us that have trusted Christ, we pray that you would just help us, help us to be faithful, strengthen us. And we know that you do that by your spirit. Um, help us to rely on him and to, to be faithful in everything that our hand finds to do. Uh, we're tempted, we're weak, we stray at times, but we want to be pleasing to you uh, and, and we, we think about that, especially in light of Christ's return. We do pray that Christ would come quickly so that you would consummate your plan of salvation and that we would enjoy your presence forever. But we know that that you will send him when it's time and we, we rest in that as well. So thank you for the time we've had this morning to worship together. Help us as we go to our respective places to, to live faithfully for Christ until he comes. We pray in his name. Amen.